Hey guys, week two update. Hopefully you guys have all seen and started working through chapter seven. At least I hope that you have downloaded your notes and started reading through them. And then you can also find the Kahoot for chapter seven to review and the study guide. Study guide and Kahoot are both found under the resources tab. The PowerPoints for chapter seven and all of the chapters will be found underneath the PowerPoints tab. Once you have done all of that and you're ready to take the chapter seven quiz, go ahead and do so. It is due this Thursday at 9.25 a.m. And then on that same day, chapter eight quiz will open up as well and that will be due one week from that date, which is the 9th of April. So it will open up on Thursday and then be due the following Thursday. So like I mentioned before, you will always get a week to complete assignments. Then we have chapter nine to go professional behaviors and disposition survey and then we will have that exam two coming up on the 23rd of April. So that is what's to come in the course. I am going to do a quick review of the notes. I am going to keep this video to 10 minutes so it will be a very quick note session here. So what I did was I downloaded the notes from the PowerPoints tab in my UJ. What I recommend you guys to do is to either go through and highlight some of the important parts. I'm not able to highlight while I'm recording this video, so I can't do it like I normally do in class, but you guys can probably download it to Adobe Reader and highlight it within there, or else you could also print it out. You could print out the notes, go through old highlighter paper style and highlight some of the important parts. So let's keep Moving here, so chapter eight, we are up to the early American physical education and sport. Chapter seven focused more so on the gymnastics aspect. Now chapter eight, we are finally coming to the US. We are talking about what influences the different cultures and gymnastic styles had on physical education within the United States programs. So Native Americans, colonists, calisthenics, and life gymnastics all had an influence on physical education and sports. We still have German and Swedish gymnastics. We're gonna talk about their contributions. Our people of interest in this chapter are Edward Hitchcock, Dudley Sargent, William Anderson, and Delphine Hanna. And then lastly, we're gonna finish by talking about men's amateur sports and how they gained supporters and participants in the late 1800s. Okay, so Native American sports. Within the Native American culture, they closely align social and spiritual and economic aspects of life with physical activity and sport. Gambling was widespread throughout the Native American culture. Sports were played, sports played varied by tribe. Some of the different sports that they played are listed to the right here. Big Attaway is essentially lacrosse. Shinny, I'll show you a picture on the next slide, but that is more commonly known as a street hockey game for women. So the left-hand picture is the picture of Shinny, the ball stick game. Right-hand picture is more commonly known today as lacrosse or stick ball. Okay, physical activities in the colonies, so starting in the 1700s. So early settlers, their prime motivation was survival. They would hunt, they would fish, they had work-related recreation. There was nothing really outside of that. They, they were just trying to survive and they had to be physically active to do so. The Dutch had a game called Pulling the Goose. I'm not sure if you're able to click that link, but you can also Google it, just simply Pulling the Goose Dutch physical activity. What they would do is they would ride by on a horse. There would be a goose tied to an archway and they would try to essentially grab the head and pull it off of the goose as they drove by, rode by, sorry, on their horse. Okay, military training did not lead to an emphasis on physical fitness at this time. This slide right here is really important when you have fully read through chapter eight and you're ready to just kind of compartmentalize all the different aspects, come back to this slide so that you can remember who goes where, who belonged to what, and what they did. 
So you can jot notes next to these people and just kind of to keep straight who took place or who was important with German gymnastics versus American PE and Swedish gymnastics. Okay, so this is essentially your summary slide to keep track of everybody with. Okay, German gymnastics. What's important here is the Round Hill School was the pr first private school to initiate physical education. So you are going to want to highlight that point there. Also, Charles Beck was the first PE teacher at the Round Hill School. So it had an outdoor gymnastics area. It implemented German gymnastics into the U.S. physical education programs. Okay, so we got Round Hill School, Charles Beck, first teacher, outdoor gymnastics. This was all part of bringing German gymnastics to the U.S. Okay, so in the late 1820s and 1830s, there was a declined interest. So the Round Hill School closed, essentially the newness wore off. So it was no longer the new school. It, it did not last. So there's too much emphasis on nationalism and strength. Also, they would only allow German teachers to educate at the Round Hill School. So it did not, it did not last. So there was the revival of German gymnastics in the 1850s when more immigrants moved to the Midwest. They established Turner societies and held Turnfests. There is an image of what that looks like on the next slide. This led to isolated communities and limited influence. So it still had that focus on nationalism and only allowing the German teachers. So this is a Turnfest. So this is German gymnastics taking place. A lot of you guys would maybe call, you see some of these different pieces of equipment. Some are more gymnastics-like, but some also look like a CrossFit gym. Okay, Katherine Beecher. Katherine Beecher, what's important about her is she brought us calisthenics. So calisthenics are a course of exercises designed to promote health, beauty, and secure, secure strength and beauty. Sorry. So what that looked like is pictured here to the right. So she borrowed Swedish principles. There was no special room or equipment needed. It was more geared towards women and children. It was 30 minutes a day and there was no equipment needed. So it was very easy to do. She wrote a book that had visual aids to help people understand the different calisthenic moves. Dioclesian Lewis brought us light gymnastics or exercises with wands, rings, beanbags, dumbbells, Indian clubs. He also put it along to music. So Dioclesian Lewis highlight that he brought us the light gymnastics. Also know that he founded the Normal Institute for Physical Education in Boston. It was the first teacher training school for physical education. So remember this is in chapter 7. Anytime you see normal school, that is a teacher training school. Okay, so here's the light gymnastics. They have some sort of dumbbell, beanbag type of weight with their gymnastics. And remember, it is going to the beat of music. Okay, the first college physical education program. So Amherst College was the first college to require physical education. So that's going to be an important point. Edward Hitchcock was the director of the Department of Hygiene and Physical Education. One thing to point out about Edward Hitchcock right down here, he was an MD, which was common for most physical education teachers at this time. They were medical doctors. So that was the degree that they held. Okay, so his program was four days per week, still had the exercises to music, similar to Diocletian Lewis, practiced sport or gymnastics. Something important to highlight is that he brought us anthropometric measurements. So anthropometric measurements are still very common. We use them to measure height, to measure weight, waist circumference, chest girth, anything that can tell us measures of improvements of strength, or growth. That is what an anthropometric measurement is. Okay, so here's the Amherst College. Got the piano. It's not like modern day. You don't go push play on a Bluetooth speaker. There to the beat of the music was to the beat of a piano being played. 
Hey, I'm going to keep going pretty quick here. Okay, Harvard College, Dudley Sargent. He opened the Hemingway Gymnasium. He took the individualized approach. So that is what's to note about Dudley Sargent was the individualized approach. He was the first to prescribe exercise based off the anthropometric measurements. So Hitchcock brought us the anthropometric measurements. Then Dudley Sargent put them to use and actually prescribed exercise based upon those measures. He emphasized sports and running versus gymnastics. So that was another thing that was a little bit different about Dudley Sargent. He took the emphasis away from gymnastics. Here are a few of the machines that he came up with. So remember, he was individually, individual athlete focused. So these machines were to help the emphasis of sport and the overall athlete, athlete. And then he also would use those anthropometric measurements to prescribe exercise. Okay, Swedish gymnastics. We have two people of interest here. Hartvig Nason was the first to implement Swedish gymnastics in America. So he brought it to America. Then Posse introduced Swedish gymnastics to the Boston Normal School. Okay, Mary Hemingway. She has dollar signs behind her last name because she furnished the Boston Normal School. So she put a lot of her money into that Boston Normal School where she had Amy Homans be the director of the Normal School. Posse was also the first teacher. Okay, so Hemingway furnished the Boston Normal School. Amy Homans was the director. Posse was the first teacher. So graduates taught in Boston Normal School and women's schools nationally. Nationally, This led to the spread of Swedish gymnastics. So in the U.S., we had a variety of different forms of gymnastics and physical activity or physical education going on. So this called for the Battle of the Systems, the Boston Conference of Physical Training, where the big question was which gymnastics system would provide a unified national program for the U.S. So it was the most important conference in physical education ever held. It's very important in physical education. It gave exposure to various programs and gave ideas between teachers for exchange. The most important point is no one system was selected. Every system had its pros and cons. There was not a perfect system. Instead, a combination was called for. Okay, read through this quote here from Dudley Sargent. Normal schools for PE, so know that term, normal schools, teacher training. We've had that come up quite a few times. Six institutions were established in the 1800s. Spread the various programs throughout the country. Delphine Hannah, she's going to come back again in Chapter 9, so make note of Delphine Hannah. She was a student of Sergeant Lewis and Posse. She started a physical education program at Oberlin College. She implemented anthropometrics for college women. She also trained male physical education teachers to instruct other male students. She had her MD as well. She was a medical doctor. William Anderson initiated professional meetings for physical educators. He developed the Association for Advancement of Physical Education and established what we have today as Shape America. Okay, the playground movement was established to Americanize the youth children. Overcrowded cities needed to be suitable for play spaces. There was also a lot of industrialization and immigration happening at this time. So we were going to take all of these different cultures and try to create an Americanized culture. New York passed legislation to build the organized play area, 21 playgrounds sponsored by Massachusetts Emergency and Hygiene Association. Okay, just a couple more slides. Men's amateur athletics were played by the socially elite. So if you were part of the socially elite class, you would participate in baseball, racing, tennis, golf, cricket, basketball, men's amateur athletics existed before anything else. So we don't have college athletics at this time. Men's amateur athletics came first. Okay, so they offered a sport competition for the upper class males. 
Athletic clubs began to pay top athletes to complete to compete in their clubs. Money definitely impacted the game. Important bullet point is right here. In 1879, AAU Amateur Athletic Club was developed to check the evils of professionalism and promote amateur sports. So they wanted to get rid of money impacting the game. They wanted to bring it back to playing sports simply for fun. It was the goal of the AAU. Okay, James Nysmith introduced us basketball. William Morgan brought us volleyball. Modern Olympics began in 1896. Males only were allowed. Okay, now we have collegiate athletics. So remember, collegiate athletics came second. Important point, the first collegiate event to ever happen was Harvard versus Yale in a rowing competition. We then had baseball and football. Faculty committees developed to set forth rules. Initially, the students developed the rules, like the first bullet point says. I'm sure as all of you guys can imagine, things got out of hand. There was a lot of classes being missed. There were various issues that athletics and academics weren't quite lining up. So that was when the faculty got involved and developed the committee to set forth rules. In 1895, the Intercollegiate Conference of Faculty Representatives met, which is today's Big Ten Conference. Now we have collegiate sports for women. Archery, croquet, and tennis did not require revealing clothing, so that is why they were the most widespread. Cycling was a radical change for the sake of the outfits that were worn. So this lady pictured to the right here, she's wearing bloomers. This was considered, or I'm sorry, this was considered revealing clothing. So much different than how we see different active wear today. But this lady was considered to have a revealing outfit, as did all cycling athletes wear. Many women were able to participate in baseball, basketball, and rowing against the physician and societal opposition. So women were portrayed or thought of as to have their role at home and to keep their bodies healthy to bear children. And at this time, we weren't really sure or physicians and societal views thought that this was going to harm their body to be physically active. Okay, first women's collegiate event was 1896. It was a basketball game. Okay, last thing, I recommend using these end little bullet points or summaries on these different people and different events to review for chapter eight. I'm sure I went over my 10 minute time frame that I was going to try to stick to, but I just wanted to get through the notes as quickly as I can to highlight some of those important bullet points. If you guys have any questions on any of the content, please shoot me an email. If you have any questions filling out study guides, cahoots, quizzes, whatever it may be, please email me or you guys have my phone number. You can text or call me anytime and I will get back to you. Okay, don't forget about chapter 7 quiz and start working on chapter 8 as soon as you can. Have a good rest of the week, you guys.